Muchas gracias, buenos días. And muchas gracias, Chantal, for, for inviting me. And it's great to be here and, and to share with you some ideas about science. Uh, as you have heard, I'm a philosopher of science and an evolutionist in Italy, but I'm, I'm doubly happy to be here today because in Italy I've been director of several uh, science festivals in Genoa, in Bergamo, in Rome, so I know very well this experience. I love so much the, uh, the, the possibility to have in a town, in a, in a nation, uh, these uh, events of democracy, of knowledge, of sharing knowledge with people. So congratulations, it's great to be here for the first time. Um, my talk will be related to science, not to evolution today, not to my field. Uh, I, I study speciation, so I study the tree of life and the, the, uh, the evolution, the change in nature. They told me that I have to speak in English and that I have to speak slowly. It's not so easy for me, but I have to speak slowly for the translator and for the interpreter. And I decided to talk about one of my favorite uh, topics in science, in philosophy of science, that is serendipity. And it's wonderful that I, 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 I knew that in, in, in Spanish is serendipia. What is serendipity? I will try to explain to you some, some points related to serendipity. This is one of my, my technical uh, field of research. And I will share with you uh, many stories about serendipity. Usually, maybe if you look at, if you, if you search in the vocabulary or if you search in, in, in different languages, serendipity, serendipita in Italian, serendipity in Spanish is related to the fact that we discover something just by chance. So it's an incidental discovery, happy incidental discovery, and nothing more. But this is not exactly true. Serendipity in science is something much more complex and much more interesting. And the main message that we'd like to discuss with you, to, to share with you, is the fact that serendipity, if you understand well serendipity, you can really understand well what means to be to, to do science, what is scientific methodology today, because serendipity has to, to refer to uncertainty in science, the role of mistakes in science, the generative role of mistakes in science, uh, the continuous challenge of science against what we don't know, what we know that we don't know, and even what we don't know that we don't know. This is the the wonderful uh, message around serendipity. So, a first story is this one. It's a story of a Japanese scientist, uh, Shimomura, and, and it's a story related to the tragedy of the second atomic bombs on Japan after Hiroshima. Uh, this scientist was a refugee of the first uh, atomic explosion in Hiroshima, and he was 16 years old at that time, and he inhabited around Nagasaki. And he was shocked by the explosion, and he decided to, to come back to, to the home of his grandparents. And fortunately enough, his grandmother decided to, uh, to um, clean his body in a very profound way, with very hot water, and this guy survived to the atomic bombs and survived until 90 here. When, when he was, he died when he was 90 years old, and he won the Nobel Prize 10 years before he died. Why he won the Nobel Prize? Because by chance he was, again, refugees by two atomic bombs and survivor of two atomic bombs. Near to his house, of the house of, of his grandmother, there have, been, uh, there have been translocated the, um, uh, the room of the, of the University of Pharmacy in Japan. So by chance, he decided to study biochemistry. And he decided to study proteins related to possibility, possible application to pharmacology. And he decided to, to, to come to Princeton in the United States. He was quite brilliant. And in Princeton, he decided to, 
initiate for the first time what we call today a basic science line, a line of research, of pure research, we say also. Pure research means that you don't know absolutely in the beginning of your research if you will have applications, if you will have technological result from your research. It's a basic research. It's a research curiosity driven. So driven by just by your intellectual curiosity and your desire to understand the biological phenomena. And the curiosity of, uh, of Shimomura was the proteins able to produce luminescence in jellyfish. In this species, Equata victoria, and, and he discovers in this protein what we call today a wonderful and a very powerful cell marker. So now we know that this protein is activated by calcium. Calcium is, is able to produce green light and blue lights, and we use this green fluorescent protein as a way, for example, for mapping the activation of genes in the bodies of animals. So we use it. We use it in, in our department of biology at the, in the University of Padua. And he won the Nobel Prize in 2008. So it's a classical example of a series of contingent events able to produce a completely unexpected result. And you know, there's a lot of stories like this in, in science. This is something related to serendipity. So freedom of research, freedom to be able to apply just your curiosity, and then you discover something that you were not looking for. That's the point. Uh, so the first message is that serendipity is something related to the importance of basic science. The term itself, the word itself, is, has a wonderful story. It's a story related to a passage between different disciplines and different languages, because serendipia, serendipity, is the root of a, of a word related to a, re, a region, to the Sri Lanka, to the Ceylon Island, that in Europe, during the Renaissance and before, even in the medieval age, was something like a paradise, like a mythical paradise, a very exotic place with, with wonderful fruits, with wonderful products. And around in, 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 in 1548, uh, Cristoforo Armeno, that was a, was a refugee from Armenia in Venice. Venice, you know, was the, one of the main um, um, towns of connection between Western civilization and, and Eastern civilization. Decided to translate a novel written uh, many centuries before by a wonderful uh, Persian writer that was Amir Khusrau, that we call the, the Dante of the, of the East, right? And one of these novels by Amir Khusrau, maybe you know that this was the corpus of novels that then produced the uh, Mille Una Notte, okay? So this, this great condensation of stories from the Arab, Indian, and Persian tradition. And one of these novels is related to a very peculiar narrative plot. The plot is the fact that you have three princeps of the king of Ceylon, of Sarandip. So the three princeps of Sarandip, that, and, and the father decides to um, send them outside the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the kingdom in order to make experiences of the world. So it's a classical example of the narrative plot of the uh, initiation, right? So you, you need to experience life directly in order to become able to, to be a king in the future. And they are, they are three princes very highly educated. And what, is, what, what happens in the, in the novel is that every time they, the three princes, are able to clearly understand what is happening in nature, so the natural phenomena, they are able to see very teeny clues in nature, and they are able to predict the existence of entities that they never saw, they never have seen. 
For example, they predict the existence of, 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 of an horse or the camel uh, without seeing it. And this is very interesting because this narrative is exactly related to what is magic in science many times. Maybe you know the story of the gravitational waves of the Higgs bosons or and many, many others, discoveries of planets. They are all entities that scientists predicted before seeing them. So science is something related to the curiosity to see nature, the clues of nature, and the ability to predict the existence of entities that you, haven't, that you didn't see. And this is interesting. So uh, this novel then has been translated in Europe and completely and in many ways reinterpreted by other writers. For example, if you remember Zadig, it's a wonderful narrative novel by Voltaire. Zadig is exactly the same narrative plot. Maybe you know the Umberto Eco, the name of the rose. The name of the rose begins exactly with this narrative plot, but also many, many other stories. And two centuries after, another writer, Horace Walpole in, in, in England, uh, decided to interpret this novel, giving another, an additional meaning of the term. So look at nature in a, with a with the ability to see clues and to predict the existence of entities, looking about the natural phenomenon just with freedom and curiosity, but also, according to Horace Walpole, the three principles you see in Italian, the, the exact, exact translation, they continued to make discoveries by chance or and sagacity of something that we are not looking for. So serendipity is exactly when do you discover something that is different with respect to the original question that you had in the, in the early stages of your research. So you are looking for something, and you discover something completely different and completely unexpected. So it's exactly the arrival of the unexpected in the research. Uh, if you look at the examples of real serendipity that we have, it's a very long list. Very famous cases are the, the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming. That this is not exactly a serendipity. It's what I call a weak serendipity, because Alexander Fleming, maybe you know the story, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of penicillin, and the, 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 the initiation of the story of antibiotics, Fleming had in his mind exactly the desire to discover antiseptics. So the question was there for military reasons, maybe you know. And then by chance and by um, incidental observations, he was able to reach the result to discover in a, in a fruit of melon from the Indiana state in the United States, uh, a specific um, antibiotic, very powerful antibiotic, the penicillium. It's a discovery related to incidental observations, but related to the question since the beginning. So it's not exactly a serendipity. Then the discovery of X-rays by, by William Renton. The cosmic background radiation is another wonderful story of serendipity. So using an antenna for an observation of radio sources in the sky, and then the discovery of a completely different source. So the, so the cosmic radiation from the Big Bang, and again and again, many technological examples, the microwave oven vulcanization, uh, Teflon, artificial silk, and so on, and so on, and so on. The saccharin. There are some disciplines that are plenty of serendipities. Uh, pharmacological sciences, medicine, chemistry. Uh, a very recent example of serendipity is gene editing. Because gene editing, maybe you know, was a, was a line of research started with, with people with just, we calculated no more than 5,000 euros as, as funds, okay, in Spain, in the United States, in Japan, in other, in other labs. They had, they put a good question. So they were interested in studying the immune system of bacteria against viruses. So how bacteria can be able to 
remember the attack of his enemy, viruses and, and bacteria are the two great enemies in evolution, right? So, so the, the fights between bacteria and viruses stand for, for two billion years, okay? So they discovered just by, thanks to this curiosity, the fact that in bacteria, the bacteria invented in evolution one billion years ago, so it's an invention of evolution, what we call today at the possibility to edit DNA. So they invented a nuclease protein able to cut and copy DNA. So they are able to copy the, the, the DNA from the virus and remember the attack of the virus. So immune system of bacteria against, against viruses. Immediately after, we understood, and other guys, and also two wonderful two women in science, so um, um, uh, Jennifer Dudna and Elisabeth Charpentier discovered and understood that this invention of bacteria could be applied also to eukaryotic cells and to whatever. And they discover what we call today gene editing, another Nobel Prize, another recent Nobel Prize. So, a question related to a curiosity about evolution, remote evolution, without any expected application, and then the gene editing, a wonderful and very powerful technology that today we use everywhere in biotechnologies. In this case, you can also understand that serendipity is an incredibly high, uh, highly gaining economic investment. Because this, this story started with $40,000, okay? And now you can find in Wall Street two, three, four companies that do just gene editing. So it's an incredibly a wonderful economic investment, but completely unpredictable. And that's another point that we have in serendipity. I will discuss very soon. Uh, this is my serendipitous hero, is Joseph Priestley. Um, because in his life, Priestley in chemistry had many, many different serendipities because he discovered the water fruit properties of rubber, then the carbon dioxide by chance observing the fermentation of beer, then the discovery of nitrous oxide as laughing gas, laughing gas, invention of soda, and then again and again from the mercury oxide, yep, saints, and discovered oxygen. Uh, and so on and so on. And also, he was able to observe in advance without understanding it, the photosynthesis process. So it's an example of continuous serendipity in a career. And this, you can find also an interesting quotation by, by Priestley, the observation of events coming from random facts is often more important than those born from a fixed design, okay? So now, just a little bit of theory in philosophy of science about how and why serendipity could be so ubiquitous in science. One reason is that in philosophy of science, so far, we studied mainly what we see here in the left part of the slide. So what we call in philosophy of science the context of justification. We know a lot about that. So in philosophy of science, we know Okay, we can do analysis of the, uh, the justification of a theory, uh, the science as a product, so we can reconstruct the rational uh, process of uh, building a theory, and then the justification of a theory, the confrontation between different hypotheses, and so on and so on. Okay, so we have a lot of stories about that. But quite everything here supposes that you have already discovered something. So we don't know quite nothing about what we see in the right part of, the, of this slide. So the context of discovery. So what happens during the process of science when someone discovers something completely new, expected or not expected? In philosophy of science, usually, this part of the story has been considered marginal due to the fact that people very important and influent like Karl Popper and many other thought that this was just a matter for psychologists, for sociologists, not for epistemologists, so people working on the core of the functioning of science. 
But I think that they were wrong, because this part of science now is very important, because we have different processes of possible discovery and creativity in science, and also now it becomes very, very important to understand the process of creativity and discovery, because we need to fund, we need to have support for science, for creative science today. So this is the basis of, of serendipity, the fact that as in this famous quotation by Bertrand Russell, in science you have always to challenge something that you don't know. So it's a continuous challenge, starting from a back now, background knowledge, what, we, what you already know, and then you have to challenge what you, do, you, you far, so far you don't know. And for example, if you use induction, so the generalization from your previous experience, in order to predict something new, you can be wrong, okay? You, it's a very risky okay, activity, like in the case of, of the, this very funny story of the Turkey uh, described by, by Bertrand Russell, so the inductive Turkey, okay? So, so that's interesting because in science you have, you have always an element of uncertainty, okay, in, in the challenge that you have. And also in the case of Karl Popper that was wonderful in explaining to us that science is not a matter of verification of theories, but it's a matter of falsification of theories. So what, in, what is important in science is not to, to, to have the truth, okay? But in science, what is important is the methodology to try to challenge whatever you know, so the falsification. And if your theory, your ideas, resist to, self, to falsification, you can consider your ideas robust, robust and, 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 and strong enough to survive. But even in this case, the problem is still there and not answered in Karl Popper. So, how we can propose new theories, how we can propose the different hypotheses that they can falsify an existing theory. If, if I want to falsify something already existing in science, how can I choose, for example, new observations, new evidence? How can I build new experiments? This is the, the, pro, the creativity of science. Good questions, not just data not just the description of data, but good questions, creativity, imagination. If you have to predict the existence of entities that you have never seen, you need imagination. So science is a magical uh, mix of rigorous methodology and imagination and foresight. So this is the paradox of serendipity in philosophy of science. So serendipity is very important. Is very diffused. He is very, very, even economically, very convenient, but it's unpredictable. We cannot plan for serendipity. We cannot plan for something that is, that is unpredictable. But maybe something is changing now. This is a wonderful example. In Europe now, we have a line of funds in the European Research Council led by this wonderful researcher in the University of Sussex, Oid Yacoub. And for the first time, our most important um, institution for uh, financing research decided to fund a line of research exactly to answer this question. How is it possible to produce or maybe promote uh, the probability of serendipity in science? Because serendipity is at the core of the future uh, scientific methods. So Ohid Yacoub decided to propose this line of research, and I, we are collaborating in different labs in Europe. So trying to go beyond an, an anecdotal evidence, so not just to list examples of serendipity, but for the first time, propose a theory of serendipity. Uh, another very important question. Is serendipity more frequent in basic science or applied science? Because the second question is, it's better if I, if I fund just applied science or maybe pure science and basic science, and in which proportions, so with which balance? 
And again, curiosity-driven research has the basis of research, as the basis of, of um, policy uh, for science. And just very briefly, in this line of research, we are discovering different typologies of serendipity. Some are very funny. Anyway, these are four, uh, it's a taxonomy of four different types of serendipity. For example, interdisciplinary serendipity is very important. When you are looking for something in a discipline and you discover something that is important, not for your discipline, but for a completely different discipline, okay? Like, like in the case of Brownian um, uh, movements, like right? So it, it was an observation by a botanist and it was very important for physics and so on. So uh, discovery, uh, arriving in a, in a field that are able to illuminate another field. Discovery made when just a solution is reached by an unexpected fact, so accidental discovery, like in the case of Van der Bush um, policy uh, decision in the United States. Maybe you know the story. After the Second World War, Van der Bush was the chief of the, of the program for the United States for science and technology, and the, the main idea in Van der Bush was we have to found just basic science, just curiosity. Applications will arrive, don't worry. Just apply, just use basic science. So free research. Uh, again, a completely open um, and hunt brings about discovery. And, all, and the fourth uh, typology is wonderful, is my favorite, because it's a special kind of serendipity, and I will conclude with this one. It's a serendipity in which you discover something that you were not looking for, okay, but Specifically, you discover something that is a solution of a problem that doesn't exist. You find a solution for a problem that is in the future, not a problem for you when you do the discovery, but for the future. This is absolutely wonderful case of serendipity. Um, another point that is very important in this line of research, maybe in South America, maybe in Chile, because now we are discovering, now we are discussing in many nations, in the United States, for example, about the policies for science related to this research. What are the ecological surrounding conditions that can promote serendipity? And they are very interesting. Abs absolute observation, okay, not just uh, description of data, uh, but also sagacity, exactly like in the three principles of serendip, okay? Uh, new systems of observation, of course. You have wonderful stories here in the Atacama Desert of the fact that when you have new technologies, for example, of the observation of the sky, you have new, even new domain of phenomena that serendipitously can appear for you, okay? So new systems of observation can open in an unexpected way, new phenomena. Uh, okay, being able to tolerate errors and mistakes. This is a wonderful expression used by a Nobel Prize, Salvador Luria, uh, Italian-born scientist, and, and then he came to the United States and he won the Nobel Prize with Max Perutz in biochemistry. And according to Salvador Luria, what is special in science the special moment of discovering science happens when you apply what he called the controlled sloppiness. That means you are so skilled in your field, you are so uh, trained and you know so well what you are doing that you can permit to be sloppy, that you can permit to be not so focused on your problem. In these special moments, according to Luria, you discover something very, very important in a serendipitous way. You discover something unexpected that was much, much more important than what you were looking for, okay? So tolerance of error, which lets in unexpected events occur, allowing their sources to be traced. Then again, slow science, one main enemy against serendipity is to is, is that you have to publish or perish. So, or the fact that you j continue to work on the mainstream of, of, a, of a line of research. There's no serendipity here. You can implement what you already know, 
but you will not, you will not discover something unexpected, okay? So slow science, not fast science. You have to tolerate the fact that you, you have to slow down research and to permit even strange lines of research. For example, in my department of biology, that is the first in the ranking in Italy today, we decided 10 years ago to apply exactly this policy. Okay? If we have 10 millions of euros to invest in, in our department per, per year, then we decided to invest 10, 7 or 8 million to lines already established of research, but always we decide to, to use also 2 billion, three, sorry, 2 million, 3 million to completely free research, just to good questions. High risky, because nine cases on 10, you, you find nothing. But these are the serendipity. When you discover something in a new line with a good question, you discover something very important and very breaking in terms of science. And then also another very important point, serendipity is promoted by interdisciplinarity. So the more a group is interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary in science, the more a group is made of people working from different approaches and languages, and the more serendipities you can have in your research. And you can clearly understand why. Because if you are looking, if you are working on a problem, on a scientific problem, and you have just, and you have a group that is too homogeneous, all the guys working on this group will have the same perspective on the problem. If you are, rather, if you are working on a problem, and you have, for example, a geneticist, a paleontologist, an archaeologist, a linguist, or uh, people working in cultural evolution, like in my case, like in my field, human evolution, it's more likely that someone else can explain to you that you are not seeing something very important because you are too focused from your perspective. So these homogeneous groups are much more creative in science. This homogeneity has a cost because you have to manage the dishomogeneity of the group, but this homogeneity, so diversity, diversity within the groups, diversity at each, at any level, are absolutely a source of creativity in science, okay? So just some point for coming in the second part of my, of my, of my discussion. Uh, it's the theory of serendipity, the, 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 the hardest part of my, of my talk. So why serendipity? And why serendipity is so diffused and so important in science? Uh, this is just the first clue. This is a very, very famous quotation by a wonderful scientist, Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur, in a famous conference in, at the University of Lille, in front of an audience of students from the college, and Pasteur desired to share with, with students the fact that, that if they choose science, a scientific career, they will not become rich people but they will have a wonderful life of serendipity. Why? Because dans les chambres de l'observation, les hasards ne favorisent que les esprits préparés. So in science, chance uh, is related, and chance can be very fortunate for people that are a mind theoretically prepared. And if you look at the definition of a mind prepared, in, in, in Pasteur is wonderful because Pasteur said a, a mind well prepared in science is a mind able to propose questions, to propose interpretations, to have imagination, creativity. And according to Pasteur, that made incredibly important discovery, of course, the good scientist is the scientist with good, good questions, with theories, with interpretations. And he said in this conference that science is not just data. It's not just big data. Big data are fundamental, of course, in science, but they are the descriptive part of science. Then we have the interpretative part of science, so the theoretical part of science. You need a theory. You need interpretation. You need to make data speak, because data don't speak by themselves. Okay? And many, many cases, 
many other quotations. These are two Nobel Prize in chemistry, for example. Wonderful, science, wonderful stories. Paul Flory saying that serendipity doesn't reduce the merit of the scientist because significant inventions need a prepared ground. So you need a prepared ground. So you have to train it, skill it. But then after this, after this training, you have to feel free to propose new lines of research and new theoretical background, new theoretical uh, lines of research. And, and Paul Flory proposed also, proposed also a wonderful metaphor in this case. He said, it's, it's like in music, in music, when you have improvisation in music, the good improvisation is not made by, uh, by scientists, by, by musicians in the early phases of career. The good improvisation is made by skilled music, musicians. They know very well the matter, they know very well their field, and then they are free to improvise. That's the, the idea. Also, the same in Carl Ziegler, discovered with Giulio Nata of plastics, materials, and so on. It's not possible to anticipate something totally new in scientific research because it's the challenge to a great unknown. But the researchers can be well prepared. And this is wonderful because if serendipity is really so important in science, it implies that in science you cannot radically, you cannot predict what we will discover in the 10 years in the future. So it's impossible. So it's impossible to predict what the next generation of scientists will discover. And I will propose to you a theory and a reason for which, for this. And this is just another quotation by another wonderful uh, scientist, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, Roald Hoffman. Under the surface of the chemistry article, you, you, all the serendipities are removed and the obstacle encountered lie well hidden. This is interesting because according to, and I, I think he's right, according to Hoffman, when you read a paper in science, the paper survived a process of standardization of the science writing, but hidden between the lines of the papers, you can find serendipities, serendipities errors, mistakes, uh, uh, fights between scientists, and so on. So under the surface of the, of the scientific article, there is the, the more important part of science. Um, this is a, one of my favorite examples of this very important point in philosophy of science, that data are not enough with us. So observation by itself is never enough in science. It's, it's related to my, the founder of my field, Charles Darwin. This is a page of one of the last uh, books published by Darwin about plants after the origin of species, after the descent of man. Darwin uh, worked a lot on, on botany. And in this chart that you see here, it's a chart related to the distribution of traits in some plants, like in Primula, for example. And maybe you, you see something strange in this table because uh, Darwin is explaining that in Primula vulgaris and in Primula auriculata, there is a strange distribution of, of some aspect of the phenotype from one generation to another. It seems that in some plants there are dominant traits and other weak traits. And the distribution between dominant and weak is 25 and 75. What is that? Is the fact that Darwin had on his table the laws of inheritance discovered by Gregor Mendel in a completely parallel way in, in different years. So we discovered recently that Darwin made uh, experiments with the same plants, so peas, uh, sweet peas, painted lady, and so on. So the same plants that were used by Gregor Mendel. And he exactly observed not intermediate, so discrete traits, Mendelian traits, and he discovered quite the right proportions of the distribution of the Mendelian traits in one generation to another. The, second, the first and the second law of inheritance by Mendel. But Darwin 
was completely unable to understand what he was observing. He didn't understand what he was observing. And he completely misunderstood, and he, he wrote that these observations were just marginal anomalies. Not, they cannot be true. And he missed another revolution, because he, in this case, he would have discovered the second part of the theory of evolution. So natural selection, tree of life, but also the laws of inheritance. So the missing part of, of his long argument has he wrote in a, in a book, The Varieties. So why? Maybe because Darwin was not a mathematician and was not skilled in statistics. Another very important reason Darwin had in mind a wrong theory of inheritance, so a completely alternative theory of inheritance, wrong. The idea that inheritance of traits um, was due to the fusion of the traits one generation after another. So fusion of traits, not discrete proportion of traits related to genes okay, so and, and, and genetic mutations. So he had the wrong theory in mind. He was not skilled like Mendel in physics, statistics, and mathematics. He was unable to understand something that was very clear. So this is another example in Darwin, not in Mendel. Wild type, pelotic type, with the near complete, complete dominance of a trait with, with the segregation of recessive allele in the second generation. So this is a wonderful example of the fact that a single observation is not enough. If you don't have in your mind, a, if you don't have a prepared mind, if in, in your mind you don't have the right theory, the filter of your eyes in order to interpret the data, you will not discover something very important in science. So a single observation is not enough. So just concluding with the theory, so the, the first conclusions of this line of research is, are quite interesting. For example, serendipities come both from basic science, this is trivial, of course, but also in applied science. What is interesting, what is important is that you had to have a question. Then serendipity comes if you are free, slow, creative uh, in your research. It's due to the environment, sagacity, and accident, okay, and are related, and this is my theory and my final section, the theory of serendipity. So why serendipity is so ubiquitous in science? For me, and for other philosophers of science, this is due to the fact that we are ignorant. I know that ignorance is not a good thing in our minds, but in science, ignorance is something absolutely important. In science, a very important sentence is to say, I don't know. And I try to know because I know that I don't know. Okay? I don't know, in, in Chile or in South America, but, but in Europe and in Italy, during the pandemic, many people uh, were exposed to a great visibility in mass media, and they explained science just in terms of products, data, without explaining ignorance. So the degree of uncertainty that always is in our job, okay, in our work. So explain the method, explain uncertainties, because science when you, for the festival of science, I think it's important. According to me, I, I, I strongly feel that when you explain science, you, of course, you have to explain products, theories, what we know, uh, data. But what is much more important is to explain the genesis of these results, not just the products, but the processes. So methodologies, errors, mistakes, human stories, real stories, specific stories, uncertainties, doubts, and what we don't know about something. So I think this is the most important part of, of communication of science as well. So finally, uh, why serendipity is so diffuse? For a reason that has been explained in a completely involuntary way by a, a, a quite n now neglected in our story, uh, Secretary of State of the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, because maybe you know, 20 years ago, uh, Donald Rumsfeld was the Secretary of State of the United States during the war in Iraq, okay? And maybe you remember that, that, that the war in Iraq was justified by the presence, supposed 
presence of um, uh, arms of extermination, right? Biological arms, chemical arms, and so on. So after the, the words, the, um, the camera, the, the parliament in the United States um, had a dialogue, had, 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 had an, um, a meeting with Donald Ramson, and they interrogated Donald Ramson about what he knew about the existence of not of these harms of mass destruction in Iraq. And in a funny way, Donald Ramson answered in this way, I don't know. And why I don't know? Because in politics and in geopolitics, there are known knowns. So things that we know, we know. And this is clear. But also know that there are known unknowns. So we know that there are things that we don't know. And that's quite interesting, because in this case, you have the knowledge in order to understand that you don't know something. Now I will present to you some examples in science. But there are also a third category that are the unknown unknowns, things that we don't know that we don't know. And according to Ramsell, we didn't understand so far what he meant by that. The, the existence or not of the arm of destruction in Iraq was something unknown unknowns for him and for the, uh, for the United States. So a completely un understandable answer. But, but in an involuntary way, it's an interesting taxonomy for these three categories. Just for example, this is a wonderful quotation by, by Karl Popper, so about the ignorance, the role of ignorance in science. For example, uh, there are things that we know that we don't know, of course. We know that we don't know how many biological species are inhabited the, the, the herd. Okay? We have a linear name for two millions or something more, but we have many reasons to think that this is the real number of biological species or nerd are, it's much higher, maybe three times higher, four times higher, according to Edward Wilson and others. So in this case, we know that we don't know. Okay? We know that we don't know the number of the exoplanets that could have life on, on the universe. Okay? We don't know, but we know that we don't know. Okay? That's, I think it's clear. But in other cases, in science, you appreciate the fact that you don't know, that previously you didn't know that you don't know. A wonderful example is in physics, okay, dark energy and dark matter. Okay, in this case, you have the consequences of theoretical models. Carlo Rovelli has been here. My, my friend Carlo Rovelli could, could explain to you this point. So in this case, you have theoretical consequences of your observation of the, of the, of the orbital, of the uh, movement of uh, orbitation in galaxies and so on. You have con theoretical consequences of your model of the inflation of the universe and so on and so on. And the consequences of, the, of your theoretical models is that if you want that your model can run, can work, you have to suppose that what physics studied so far from Galileo, Copernico, Galileo to Newton to, to Einstein and so on and quantum mechanics was just less than 5% of whatever exists in nature because all the rest is dark energy, is dark matter. In this case, it's not just that you know that you don't know. In this case, you, in an unexpected way, you have the consequence that you discover that you are very ignorant. We, we studied just the 5% of the universe so far. So we have to discover much more, new questions, new research, new line of research, new serendipities. Okay? That's the reason why, according to me, serendipity is so diffused. Because if the unknown is so great, your theory, what is your theory? It's something like a light, like a cone of light through which you illuminate the dark. But the dark is greater and greater. So if you move your light a bit, you can discover in the dark something completely unexpected for you. So if the dark is so great, serendipity is so ubiquitous and so diffused. So ignorance. 
So just to, to explain to you a couple of examples of this, this is my favorite serendipity. So the serendipity in which you discover a solution of a problem that doesn't exist at your time. This is the example of Eduard Benedictus. He was working at the end of uh, 19th century on colloid um, materials, the ancestor of plastics, okay, polymers and so on. And he made an accidental observation. So a flask uh, that he, he was using in, in his lab was, was broken, but felt on the ground and broken, but he observed that the glasses broken still remain together connected. So why? Because he didn't see that within um, the flask, a teeny, a narrow um, um, surface of colloid were able to keep the glasses together. Just an accidental observation, no applications, no meaning. But he decided to, to, to put this observation in his notes, and he decided not to turn away this observation. Many years after, afterwards, I think 20, no, 15, 18 years later in, in Paris, he read on a newspaper that there were a new problem. The first cars moving on, 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 on the city, on, on the streets, had a problem because when they had accidents, the glass were broken with great damage for people in, in, in the car. And so he came back to his previous observation and he invented the unbreakable glass. So two um, uh, layers of glass and within a layer of colloid and he invented the unbreakable uh, glasses that then have been applied in the first uh, world war in the planes and then again and again in the cars. And he had the uh, permission for using uh, this invention in 1909, uh, and he became one of the richest people in Paris. And now if you look at the name Edouard Benedictus, you will find it in the web as the founder of the Art Deco in Paris, because he decided to renounce to science, and he became a billionaire and applying his money for hearts. So he was able to discover a solution to a problem before the problem appeared. And this is wonderful in science because you can have also not just so funny examples, but, but even more mysterious example. This is one of the most famous mis mystery in philosophy of science. We don't have the answer. If you have the answer, you are welcome. Because in science, many times, there are guys working like Bernard Riemann just has Benedictus with accidental, with playing with mathematics, playing with mathematical languages, uh, matrix language, complex number languages, or non-Euclid geometries languages. So a catalog of non-Euclidean geometries just, just playing with mathematics, okay? The century before, a century after, you discover that one of the geometries invented by Bernard Riemann, one century later, was exactly the geometry that describes the universe, the universe of the general relativity. So before you have the mathematics, playing with the mathematics in your mind, just in your mind, and then a century later you discover that one of the, of the game that you invented in your mind is the description of the universe. Not the reverse as we expect, before the physics and then the mathematics that you can apply to describe the physics. Before the mathematics and then maybe the physics. And this is a mystery, so this is what we call the irrational uh, efficiency, the irrational ability to mathematics to describe the world. And I think that the most interesting answer has been written by this wonderful mathematician, Jacques Adamard. 
that, that wrote this wonderful quotation. This is my final point. Many believe the stereotype according to which the profession of the scientist would be like that of a painter who wakes up in the morning, opens the window, sees a wonderful landscape outside, and represents it on the canvas as faithfully as possible. So many people think that science is description. Okay? There's a wonderful landscape outside, I'm a wonderful painter, and I describe in a faithful way the landscape outside. According to Hadamard, this is not what science can do. This is not the creative part of science. Why? Because the profession of the scientist, who certainly has seen many landscapes in his life, so trained, skilled, is rather that of initially remaining closed in his room to paint the best landscape that comes to his or her mind at a given moment. So imagination, simulation, playing with ideas, with, with interpretations. And only after drawing it, he opens the window and he tries to understand if there are connections between the painting he made and the landscape that was already out there. This is quite counterintuitive, but if you look at the most important discovery in science, always is exactly this case. So, Bock, uh, um, boson Higgs, the Higgs boson, gravitational waves, gene editing, all the examples, okay? So you have many different paintings, and then you have a correspondence between your theories and the reality out there. If he finds them, then he has discovered something interesting about the landscape, so about the reality, but also about the mind who painted it. So, uh, of course, Serendipity is a challenge because if you has, has people working for the new generations of scientists that maybe in this young audience could be, um, we have to promote serendipity. We have to promote basic science, curiosity, freedom of research, freedom of teaching, freedom of expression. And we need also what we call uh, in philosophy of science, cathedral thinking. It's a wonderful uh, metaphor. Cathedral thinking means that you have to be you have to have foresight for the future. So in the cathedral thinking, you start to build something like a cathedral, but you know that you will not see the cathedral completed in your life. Maybe your the next generation or two or three generations. So we need cathedral thinking. And just a final example that is related to even also a Spanish story, or even anyway related to Spanish literature, because this is another wonderful story. This is uh, my friend, Nobel Prize, Frances Arnold, that works in, she works in California. She won a Nobel Prize in, 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 in chemistry in 2018. And she, when she, she was young, she visited Madrid and, and, and she read the, the masterpiece by Borges, the Library of Babel. And for, for Frances, this was just a metaphor but a very fruitful metaphor coming from literature, like a serendipitous terms from Sarandip. And the metaphor was the possibility to have a library with all the possible combinations of a language. So books without any meaning, books, as Borges uh, wrote, with just one sentence with a meaning and the rest is noise, or the uh, comedy by Dante or the, the Bible, so books with a story and, and full of meanings. Uh, ten years later, he decided to apply this metaphor to proteins. And, he, and she thought, if I, if, I, if I build a library of proteins, I can have all the combinations that I know today, so like Bible, or Dante, okay, so the existing combination, but I could explore other possible books of proteins, so other combinations. She invented what we call today the directed enzyme evolution, that is something like an artificial selection of proteins. So you, you, you take the code of a protein, you change just one teeny uh, base, so just one word, just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, a piece of the alphabet, 
and then you look at the effects, and then you change again and again and again. And you explore all the possibilities in the library, like, like moving in the library of Borges. And the metaphor is exactly the library, the bubble uh, library of Borges. And for 20 years, the other scientists working in the same field wrote that this was impossible, because when you have to build a protein, you have to start from nothing, and you have to, to put together the pieces of the protein, rather than, like in the case of Francis, exploring the existing uh, enzymes and proteins and exploring the libraries of the possibilities starting from the realities. And what was wonderful is that Francis Arnold discovered proteins that nature never evolved, never discovered, but that are very important. They could do, they could do wonderful things. And now we can apply these enzymes and the protein to many industrial um, lines to, uh, for cleaner products, new drugs, new vaccines, uh, green technologies, and so on and so on. Uh, a cascade of serendipitous technologies started with a metaphor, the Babel of Borges, applied not to books, but to genes and to proteins. This is serendipity, okay? This is the Babel, uh, the library of, of Babel that you can find uh, in science. And this is my, my final words. Thank you.